Thank you. The gentlelady yields back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Fluger, for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Had problems turning the uh, the microphone on, um, and I appreciate you letting me wave on. And Dr. Cavazzoni, I'll start with you. I want to talk about price setting, and want to talk about um, competition, and specifically the IRA. Uh, so, you know, when we look at understanding that the IRA lets some biosimilar uh, manufacturers have a chance to compete, quote unquote, uh, by allowing a pause before uh, a brand biologic product's price is set, um, and especially if a biosimilar is likely to enter the market within two years. Um, but just kind of, you know, have a, some questions in my head about the timelines and the criteria uh, and whether those are still insufficient. And so given the, uh, the uncertainty that I believe has been created by the IRA, how is the FDA planning to provide predictability for biosimilar manufacturers to ensure continued investment uh, and development in this market? Yeah, yeah. We we are um, we are uh, very committed to continuing to work with the biosimilar manufacturers. Our biosimilar program is a success. We have uh, approved the 50th biosimilar a couple of weeks ago. Uh, there's two areas that I th we think will be important will be particularly important. Uh, number one, um, we uh, really want to find ways to uh, develop biosimilars with less clinical data using the analytical methods and the structure of the biosimilar. So we have a lot of work there. The second one is that we think that the uh, statutory the, uh, uh, differentiation between a biosimilar and an interchangeable, interchangeable biosimilar is not needed and we think that by removing that, removing that statutory difference we would really make some inroads in making biosimilar in a, um, easier to access uh, allowing substitution at the time of prescription and so on and we would be very happy to work with Congress uh, to, to address those barriers. Do these measures include, in, in, in the nature of streamlining, do they include uh, um, updates from FDA to CMS on those biosimilar products that are currently in, in the process? In the pipeline? Yes, we, we, we talk to, to, to CMS uh, um, uh, along these lines. We communicate when it's needed. Uh, our focus uh, in our program is really to make it uh, easier, less expensive, and less cumbersome to develop biosimilars so that we have more out there and more that are interchangeable and uh, can be substituted. Would you say that the competition um, between these manufacturers has led to the savings, um, billions of dollars of savings? Is that a good thing? There is data that support that, that the biosimilar you program... you believe that data? The, the biosimilar, we, we'd be happy to follow up. Do you believe that data? Uh, I do believe it, okay. yes, absolutely. I'll move on to ethylene oxide. Uh, I'll talk to you, Dr. Sharon, about this. Um, very worried about the EPA's decisions on ethylene oxide, and I want to know kind of what the FDA is doing to work with uh, EPA to ensure that we don't have shortages in the surgical products and, you know, biosimilar products or any in the value chain that are, that are affected by this. Obviously, it's something that's used to, um, to sterilize a lot of different uh, pharmaceutical, surgical, emergency room products. Look, we, we appreciate the important work that EPA does in our role was to try to inform that to minimize disruptions for important medical devices. And so, um, we did work with the, FD, with the uh, EPA to provide important feedback on the impact of their proposed rule. They made changes. We're still working with the EPA and we're monitoring those sterilization facilities to see what happens during implementation to again try to minimize the likelihood for sh device shortages. Is it, could I characterize it by saying that the FDA has concerns over EPA's rule regarding ethylene oxide? I think it would be fair to say we appreciate the changes they made in their final rule, which were helpful. And Are there we're more changes to work that still on. need to be made? Um, at this point, uh, our sense is that we may be in a good place, and we'll monitor to see what the real impact is. Patient safety, our supply chain, the overall health of our healthcare system kind of resides on you working with them to get to a better place. Uh, yes, and uh, I'll put a plug in. We also need for help from Congress on authorities to prevent device shortages. We heard a lot about drugs, but we need help on devices because they're happening every day, and we don't have all the tools we need to prevent that. Um, lastly, for any of you, uh, Dr. Marks, you can take a shot at this, or uh, Dr. Cavazzoni. Um, is FDA approving things in a, in a timely manner that allows safety but also um, 
innovation to happen. Yeah, I, I would say that we are trying to move things through as, as rapidly as we can with, while maintaining what somebody already said here was our gold standard. Can, can, you're trying, and I get that. Can we do better? Um, listen, we, we are always trying to do better, um, and I think that's something that continuous improvement will continue to try to do, and that's a commitment we have. It's a lot of continues. I like that. I'll yield back. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. The gentleman yields back.